The following program is a dramatic reenactment. Certain events have been altered and names have been changed. The story you're about to see is based upon first-hand accounts of the actual events. Navy SEALs entrust their lives to their training. But no matter how much they prepare, they often face the unexpected. When sent to seize Panamanian dictator Noriega, everything goes wrong. America's elite forces are ambushed and in a firefight for their lives. In 1961, an elite team of special forces was created for covert operations on the sea, air, and land. Their missions have been kept secret for national security reasons. Who they are and what they do has remained shrouded in secrecy. Now, based on first-hand accounts of classified operations, these are the untold stories of the Navy SEALs. December 1989. The Central American country of Panama was in chaos. In an effort to control protests against his regime, dictator Manuel Noriega ordered his PDF, or Panamanian Defense Forces, to clamp down on the civilian population and the U.S. troops stationed there. The PDF heavily fortified their headquarters and set up rigid curfews. All cars were stopped and checked for violations. On the night of December the 16th, four United States Marines got lost on their way back to their barracks. They claimed they accidentally wound up at PDF headquarters after curfew. Adelante. The PDF soldiers were immediately suspicious. Tensions mounted as the Panamanians sought to assert their authority. The Americans realized they were in imminent danger and decided to make a run for it. The PDF opened fire, shooting to kill. In the barrage of gunfire that followed, Lieutenant Robert Paz, a Marine intelligence officer, was hit. He died later that night. Just stay calm, wait a minute. Tom Marcote, a naval officer stationed in the canal zone, was out with his wife, Carol. Stay in here. Stay in the car. They now found themselves witnesses to the violent assault of the American Marines. Tom, this is serious. What do you want? What's going on here? Hey, all right. The PDF was not interested in hearing explanations. The Marcotes were brutally beaten and detained for hours. Eventually, they were released. But the incident triggered outrage in the U.S. Already, international public opinion had turned against Noriega for denying the elections that would have replaced him. Now the killing of a U.S. Marine and the brutal victimization of the naval couple pushed the situation beyond the breaking point. President George Bush promised action and vowed to bring the renegade dictator to justice. The day after the assault, Bush secretly ordered preparation for an invasion of Panama by American forces. Noriega remained defiant, 
and his supporters accused the U.S. government of plotting to overthrow him and his regime. Once cooperative with the CIA, facts had emerged that clearly linked Noriega with the illegal drug trafficking. He was also using his army to harass and intimidate those who opposed him. When the dictator canceled democratic elections, massive protests erupted. The U.S. federal courts brought formal charges against him. He was officially a wanted criminal. In December, the Panamanian National Assembly, a body appointed by Noriega, declared a state of emergency and named him head of state. Yet capturing Noriega was not going to be easy. In order to defeat his PDF, it would require a massive joint services invasion. War planners would employ every branch of the military, including the Navy SEALs. Overseeing the SEALs at JSOC, or Joint Special Operations Command, was Admiral Larry Walker. Given the strength of the PDF ground forces, he knew his SEAL teams would be facing one of their stiffest challenges. The war planners expected that once the invasion began, Noriega would attempt to flee the country in his private plane kept at Patilla Airport. The SEALs had a specific mission. Take Patilla Airport, block his escape, and capture him if he arrived. Walker handpicked Lieutenant Commander Mike Dillon to lead the raid. This is our target. He had proved himself in other conflicts around the globe. He could manage a combat situation and had earned the respect of his men. The SEAL's covert assault on Patia included taking out the PDF soldiers stationed there. then neutralizing the plane quickly and decisively. That's a good job, gentlemen. Bring it in! This was only an exercise, but the SEAL's rehearsal was crucial to their success. We need to make that communication between Gulf and Bravo. Timing was quicker. critical. Once the invasion began, the SEALs would have just 15 minutes to complete their mission. Otherwise, Noriega, who was only 20 minutes from the airfield, could take flight and they'd lose him. Dillon was commanding 48 men to take down the airfield, but overseeing a precision tactics group this large posed problems. It would restrict their flexibility. It also made them a bigger target, more easily spotted by the enemy. Maintaining their stealth was imperative to mission success. With only 36 hours till the mission began, the SEALs were still training in what amounted to a crash course in multi-platoon tactics. One platoon would get in close enough to take out Noriega's jet with sniper fire. And Dylan had the shooters who could do just that. One member of his platoon, Ed Marlowe, could pinpoint a target from 800 yards. A few well-placed shots could destroy the landing gear and prevent the situation from escalating. This would eliminate the threat of engaging the enemy and thereby minimize the SEAL's risk. 
To further block Noriega's escape, the SEALs had to penetrate the airfield, disable other smaller aircraft that Noriega might commandeer, and also push some of these planes into position to block the runway. This presented its own set of problems. Intelligence reported that many of the light aircraft at Patilla belonged to Colombian drug runners and were kept under armed guard. Although intelligence predicted only light resistance at the hangar, they didn't have exact numbers. Estimates range from 10 to 30 PDF soldiers. For a successful assault, Dylan knew it was best to have a three to one advantage that meant he would need as many as 90 SEALs. The 48 assigned to him would not be enough. But the Navy brass felt they could make up for any ground force disadvantage with Air Force gunships. The SEAL superiors wanted to utilize the Air Force's state-of-the-art gunship, the AC-130 Spectre. The Spectre's pinpoint accuracy could annihilate large numbers of troops, destroy tanks, APCs, buildings, anything in its sights. From thousands of feet above the battlefield. It also carried sophisticated surveillance equipment that could monitor activity on the ground, even in total darkness. Dylan was glad to have the support but he wondered if they would be maximizing the SEAL's unique capabilities that had proven to be so successful in the past. Get in quickly, complete the mission, and get out, all without detection. All right, gentlemen, a lot of bodies on the ground with close air support. The SEALs got word that the mission was on. After running their last dress rehearsal, they assembled for their final briefing. Attention on deck, as you were. The SEALs were divided into three platoons, Delta, Bravo, and Gulf. Admiral Walker had placed Captain Mark Monty as point man on the operations side of the mission. He would be coordinating the assault from JSOC headquarters. Gulf platoon would be led by Lieutenant Gil Trotman. He would maneuver into position to disable Noriega's plane. Bravo platoon, led by Petty Officer Trevor Hill, would neutralize any resistance from the drug runner security force and block the runways with the light aircraft. Delta platoon, led by Dillon, would secure a perimeter and back up the others. Surprise was crucial. Under the cover of darkness, they would take Zodiac rafts to Patia, sneak ashore, and then onto the airfield. Dylan remained concerned about detection. Lieutenant Commander is going to be passing out some photographs, overheads of the runway. The airport's well-lit runways and tarmacs would offer no cover as they advanced on the hangar. Sir, do we still have backup that's going to be covering the approaches in the event that the Panamanians send reinforcements? And we only anticipate that there will be 10 to 15 Panamanians in the area. But other reports place the number much higher. With only hours before the invasion launch, intelligence still did not have accurate estimates of enemy troop strengths at the PDF hangar. Bravo, Gulf, and Delta. The SEALs were confident they could overcome any increased resistance until the war planners dropped a bombshell. But at this point in time, I want to bring in the intelligence officer who is going to inform you of the rules of engagement. The SEALs Indeed, the entire invasion force would be required to follow highly restrictive rules of engagement mandated by the State Department. They could not fire unless fired upon. This rule eliminated the SEAL's preferred tactic of reconnaissance by fire. In a high-risk military insertion, the SEALs shoot first and ask questions later. But now they were being restrained. They also were to avoid inflicting collateral damage to Panamanian assets. The U.S. government wanted to hand over existing Panamanian property to the new government with minimal damage, which meant 
they would have to disable Noriega's jet without destroying it. Opposition to the plan began to surface. Lieutenant Commander Wayne McCarty, who oversaw the SEALs' training, was concerned about the severe rules of engagement. Using a very small number of SEALs. This plan is designed to create casualties. McCarty worried that assaulting a hangar across an open runway could spell disaster for the men. He could not, in good conscience, sign off on what he perceived as a potential suicide mission, and he let his opinion be known. Are you going to sign off on this? No, sir. Then you're dismissed. The military brass was determined to move forward with their plan, despite McCarty's protests. Stifled by State Department restrictions, the SEALs were ordered to move out. At 1,300 hours on December the 19th, they left for Panama. All right, gentlemen, let's make sure we have everything. You check your weapons and gear. Ten minutes from now, it's going to be a bad time to realize you left something at home. As Americans and Panamanians alike were preparing for Christmas, now only a week away, the SEALs left their Virginia base. They could tell their loved ones nothing of the danger they were flying into. The SEALs prepared for their mission in Panama. The U.S. military invasion would begin in a few hours. Even as the strike force moved into position, Noriega was busy beefing up his defenses. He expected the Americans would invade, and he planned to mount a vigorous response. Despite the gravity of the situation, Dillon tried to maintain the morale of his troops. Listen up, gentlemen. We have a little matter to dispense with. Mr. Rodriguez, front and center. Seaman Ike Rodriguez, as you have successfully completed all the requirements and training, it's my pride and privilege to present to you your trident. Rodriguez had proven himself through rigorous training and in countless exercises with his platoon. He had earned the right to wear the SEAL's most coveted medal, the SEAL Trident. All right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we're going to have to postpone the celebration until after our work in Panama is done. This is no exercise, gentlemen. Any mistakes from here on out are going to cost you a lot more than your pride. In addition to the 12,000 military personnel already in Panama, the United States flew in 4,200 special forces that would initialize the invasion. It was the largest American airborne operation since World War II. There had been increased diplomatic efforts by the world community to resolve the conflict in Panama. However, when talks broke down, Noriega and his officers knew the Americans would take military action. They didn't know how or when. The Panamanians routinely monitor American air traffic, but escalated tensions had intensified their efforts. Lo que sea, Pellero, es mejor que sea bueno. Señor, me parece que los americanos están moviéndose. PDF radar operators noticed an increased number of troop transport and equipment hauling aircraft, a sure sign of invasion. Y los uno treintas. But because the U.S. had military bases in the canal zone, the Americans routinely operated heavy traffic in the area. 
To hide their movements, the U.S. maintained the same number of flights to the canal zone. They changed the size and type of aircraft using heavier equipment. For days, the deception worked. But Panamanian surveillance began to identify the increased transport size, and the PDF immediately placed every military unit on alert. The SEALs had landed at Howard Air Force Base in the canal zone. After loading their gear onto combat raiding rubber rafts, they silently made their way along the coast and entered the tidal waterways around Patia Airport. Commander Dillon was still counting on the element of surprise. He approached Patia Airport unaware that the Panamanian military was gearing up for the assault. It was just after midnight, December the 20th, 1989. The United States stood minutes from war with the nation of Panama. The Pentagon was ready to unleash a massive 16,000-man U.S. task force to take over the Central American country and capture its dictator, Manuel Noriega. Commander Mike Dillon and his SEAL team moved towards the Patia Airport under cover of night. The SEALs would land at the nearby beach and set up field headquarters. Then at H hour, the moment of invasion, 1 a.m., the three platoons, Gulf, Bravo, and Delta, would approach the hangar across the tarmac. Their attack was to be synchronized with the rest of the invasion and had been planned and rehearsed down to the second. However, as the SEALs advanced on their position, American troops were spotted in Panama City. Fighting broke out immediately, and the PDF knew the invasion was on. Thunder 5, 5, Thunder 5, 5, this is broadsword 2, 3. Dillon was unable to make radio contact with the AC-130 gunship assigned to the mission. He had to have his air cover in place before he began the assault. Without radio contact, it was impossible for the Spectre to provide air support. Broadsword 2-3, Broadsword 2-3, this is Air Pop, over. The field commander on the ground not only had to give coordinates, he was solely responsible for ordering an attack. With Noriega now aware that the Americans were coming, the Pentagon moved up the official start of the invasion 15 minutes. Hundreds of field commanders quickly adapted their unit's assault plans. This is Admiral Walker. Admiral Walker at Fort Bragg, JSOC, contacted the SEALs with the news. H hour had been pushed to 12.45 a.m. I don't think I have 15 minutes to shave off this mission. But that was the least of Dillon's concerns. At the last minute, the war planners also changed Dillon's mission. He wasn't simply to disable Noriega's jet. He was to actually take the hangar and slash the jet's tires. Roger that. Two, three out. All right, gentlemen. The State Department feared that the SEALs might unleash too much firepower if they simply shot at the plane from a distance. The new directive meant putting the SEALs at incredible risk. They would have to approach the hangar and confront the PDF forces. Dillon quickly informed his men of the change in mission, just before they landed at the airfield. They encountered no initial resistance. The 
vamos a tener que prepararnos. Va a haber un ataque de los americanos pronto. Muy bien. Muy bien. The PDF officer immediately called for reinforcements. Sí. Los necesito a ustedes en el portaavión inmediatamente. Apúrense. Dylan and his men proceeded, not realizing the PDF was fortifying its position. Stand by for two, three actual. Commander, we have intercepted a radio transmission indicating that Noriega is headed towards Patilla. Copy that. We do not have an ETA at this time. Roger, out. Change of plans. Noriega's helicopter is on his way over. I'll take Delta to intercept the chopper. Bravo and Golf proceed as planned. Dylan had to move out immediately if he was going to stop Noriega, but he didn't want to go in without air support. Thunder five five. This is. Broadcast. He continued his efforts over. to raise the Spectre. Thunder five five. Thunder five five. This is broadsword two three. Over. Are we talking with that Spectre yet? No, sir, not yet. We're working on it, though. We need that air support now. Yes, sir. Thunder 5-5, five, five, Thunder 5-5. Five, five. This is broadsword. The SEAL radio operators tried changing the batteries and antennas. Thunder 5-5, five, five, Thunder 5-5. Five, five. But nothing worked. Over. The Spectre tried everything it could to communicate with the SEALs. Broadsword 2-3, Broadsword 2-3. This is Air Papa. How copy this transmission? Over. But neither side could raise the other. The command centers were swamped. The thousands of radio links were All overflowing with chatter, jamming their communication. Golf leader, Bravo leader, with me. Dylan quickly reviewed the new assault plan with Hill and Trotman. Back at JSOC, Walker continued to get confirmed reports that Noriega's helicopter was nearing Patilla. We've just intercepted more PDF radio chatter. Noriega's in his helicopter on the way to Patilla. Well, we'll need to move quickly then. Intelligence also warned of armored personnel carriers heading toward the airport. Stand by for two, three actual. Time was running out for Dylan and his men. With Noriega and APCs full of reinforcements on their way, the assault had to move forward. Copy that. Even without air support. Roger, out. Keep your eyes open. We may have some APCs coming our way. Let's move. All right. This is Broadsword 2-3, over. Do we have communication with the Spectre yet? No, sir, not yet. We're working on it. All right. You guys get at least one of these radios working. Keep me posted. We're moving out. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The three platoons began their assault. Expecting light resistance at the hangar, the less experienced SEALs remained in Gulf and Bravo platoons. They were to advance together until they reached the tarmac. Once at the tarmac, Bravo would separate to pull planes onto the runway as planned. Then they would proceed to the hangar to back up Gulf. Trotman's Gulf platoon was to head directly to the hangar and slash the tires on the jet. No longer just providing backup, Dylan and his Delta platoon now had the primary mission of intercepting Noriega's helicopter. They would have to reconnoiter the airport and determine where it might touch down. Also, when the dictator arrived, he would be heavily defended by highly trained guards. Since Delta would be the first to confront these elite forces, Dylan kept the most battle seasoned SEALs with him. As the SEALs began advancing, the PDF reinforcements arrived at Patilla. They concealed themselves in the hangar. 
Now the element of surprise was on their side. All they had to do was wait for the Americans to come closer. As Gulf and Bravo platoons moved closer to the hangar and tarmac areas, the hangar looked quiet, almost deserted. They saw no soldiers and no APCs. Delta continued their reconnaissance, waiting for Noriega's helicopter to arrive. Give me JSOC. Firestorm 60, this is Broadsword 23, over. Yeah, this is 23. Yes, sir. Any sign of that helicopter? No, sir. There's no sign of the chopper. Noriega will be there. Keep looking. The command Keep post looking. was still certain that the helicopter was coming. Copy that. Dylan had to be ready to apprehend Noriega. Dylan scouted the perimeter for PDF reinforcements and positioned Delta for Noriega's arrival. Gulf and Bravo platoons continued their advance. They could see Noriega's jet parked in the hangar. With night vision goggles, Trotman made out figures moving in the darkness. This was expected. At the briefing, they had been told they would probably see people around the airport buildings. Commander. I'm picking up some movement down by the tower. Copy. Keep your eyes open. Golf proceeded on. And Bravo platoon split off as planned to complete their mission of pulling the small planes onto the runway. The PDF soldiers had a near perfect position. The approach to the hangar was a broad expanse of asphalt. For hundreds of yards in every direction, there was no cover except for a few light aircraft. As Trotman and his golf platoon got closer, they spotted more armed soldiers. There was still no sign of Noriega. Spotted some tangos inside the hangar. Eyes up, proceed with caution. Golf continued their advance. Bravo arrived at the planes. Each squad had a Spanish speaking seal to address any locals. Knowing the planes could be guarded, the SEALs cautiously approached with their interpreter in the lead. Such a threat could be quickly eliminated with a few well-placed shots, but this contradicted the rules of engagement. The SEALs couldn't harm civilians. That included drug runners. Once they were restrained, Bravo proceeded to block the runway with small aircraft. Commander, we had some locals guarding the planes. Threat eliminated. We're just now getting back to moving the planes. Copy, I see you. Nothing yet. Where the hell is my air support? Thunder, five, five. This is broadsword, two, three, Got over. that radio working yet? No, sir, not yet. But they still could not make contact with the Spectre. No word yet, Golf. Still waiting. 
The radios used encryption equipment to scramble communications. They frantically tried different codes, but they had to work through thousands of possibilities. Dylan even tried patching through to the Spectre via JSOC. Even headquarters could not get through to the gunship. For some reason, the Spectre could not lock onto the signal and decode the incoming message. Broadsword 2-3, Broadsword 2-3, this is air popover. Let's switch to two, let's switch to two. Punch an alternate frequency. Broadsword 2-3, Broadsword... Through their sophisticated surveillance equipment, the crew of the AC-130 could see the airfield below. Yet they remained powerless to help. Broadsword 2-3, this is Air Papa waiting for your command. The Spectre's awesome firepower was immobilized. Golf moved forward with no backup. No, bajas tu arma, so te esperamos. Fuego, fuego. Golf, what's happening? Pin down, take it back, do the action. Let's attack, let's go, let's move, let's move, let's go. Get in there, get down there, let's go, let's go. Caught in the Panamanian ambush, Trotman and his golf platoon took their first casualties. I'm hit! Pinned down on the open tarmac, they were in a fight for their lives. The golf platoon under attack. Dylan and Delta Platoon rushed to reinforce them from the other side of the airport. Get heavy wounded! Bravo, get up here! Bravo's clash with the drug runners cost precious time that delayed them from reinforcing their teammates. When Bravo finally arrived, they threw themselves directly into the line of fire, shielding the wounded seals with their own bodies. Is that Spectre? What the hell's that gunship? The pilots of the AC-130 circled high overhead watching helplessly as the battle unfolded. All weapons are high this time, but I still do not have authorization to fire. Punch it two. Broadsword two, three. The PDF soldiers used armor-piercing bullets which flew right through the SEAL's flak jackets. Those that weren't shot directly got hit by flying pieces of asphalt. Trotman couldn't retreat, and he couldn't advance. Eventually, the superior marksmanship of the SEALs paid off. With every shot fired by the PDF soldiers, the SEALs got a better lock on their positions. Get in there! Get down there! Let's go! Let's go! Finally, Dylan's Delta platoon arrived. 
They took positions on the edge of the tarmac and joined the fight. Get in there! Get some help! Get in there! Let's go! Let's go! The SEALs of Delta Platoon charged directly into the firestorm, risking their own lives to drag their wounded teammates to safety. The assault had lasted only three minutes. By this time, eight men in Gulf and Bravo platoons were dead or wounded. JSOC called for an assessment report. They could hear the battle raging over their radio. Admiral Walker ordered them to abort the mission. Negative, you can't pull out. Everyone is down. We were ordered to take this airfield, sir, and that's exactly what we intend to do. Over. Take out their jets. Go. Dylan wanted to complete what they set out to accomplish. He wasn't concerned about collateral damage. The AT-4 anti-tank missile brought to defend against the APCs was aimed at Noriega's jet. Back left area clear! One, two, three. One, two, three. I'll copy this transmission. We brought to a two, three. Over. We got Spectre! Beautiful. Just beautiful. Rocket! The missile punched a hole in Noriega's jet, completely disabling it. The concussion from the blast put an end to any remaining resistance in the hangar. I'm not seeing any more movement. Can you confirm? Looks clear from here. Cover me. Call in medevac. Delta, let's fall in and mop up the pieces. Finally, it was safe for the SEALs to enter the hangar. A piso! A piso! Most of the PDF soldiers inside the hangar were dead or seriously wounded. A few shell shock survivors surrendered without a struggle. The battle was finally over. It had lasted only 15 minutes. Dylan ordered some of the SEALs to stay in the hangar and attend to the enemy dead and wounded, while he went back out to the tarmac to check on his own men. How's he doing? He's gone. Only hours after receiving his trident, the newest member of the team, Isaac Rodriguez, was dead. Ah, they could only wait for the evacuation as their seriously wounded teammates lay bleeding to death on the tarmac. When the hell is that medevac chopper? I wish I the invasion knew. forces had taken heavier casualties than expected. The medevac helicopters have been diverted to other American wounded in Panama City. We got fire! We got fire! Get in there, dead man! A few remaining PDF soldiers made a last ditch effort to inflict damage on the Americans. Quickly dispatched. Let's get that medevac here now. It was over 90 minutes later that the medevac finally arrived. 
At the Patia airport, Dylan and his men had accomplished their mission. They took the airfield and disabled Noriega's jet against impossible odds and under heavy fire. But in the end, four SEALs lay dead and nine more were seriously wounded. It was the worst single loss the SEALs had ever experienced in one mission. Overall, the invasion of Panama went on the books as a success. Noriega's helicopter never did arrive at Patia Airport. However, American forces finally captured Noriega, and he was brought to trial in the United States. The Navy came under fire for the ill-fated SEAL mission. Recriminations abounded and careers were lost. The Navy released a sanitized report about what happened at Patia Airfield. All the public ever heard was that it took 48 SEALs to disable a single airplane. <laughs>